Welcome to the afternoon session. I am Linda Kenny Bodden, and we are the Law and Crime Network, and we have a lot on tap today, as you know. I don't know. I, I have to have help today discussing this case because the crimes alleged here are so terrible. My fellow New Jersey lawyers, it's my New Jersey day here at Law and Crime. Mike Querbonics, an amazing trial attorney. You and I first met in federal court on a matter. That's correct. And Bob Hilla, who was, was the former president of the New Jersey State Bar Association. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't bring to you just any lawyers. We bring to you the best lawyers at Law and Crime Network to discuss this. So let's discuss it. Have you ever, Mike Corbonics, in all of your history of doing criminal defense, seen a case as horrible as this where, and I'll just mention one of the facts, where bleach was poured into the woman victim's mouth, Shannon's mouth? This case, we were like we were saying off camera, it's, it's almost in New Jersey, our criminal code is the 2C code. It's almost like every horrible crime in the 2C code is in this case. I don't think some prosecutors or defense attorneys go through a whole career with seeing as many of these violent crimes in their career, let alone one case. This is really, really and devastating. And Bob Hilly, I know we're going to get into some of the actual testimony, which, uh, you know, I, I almost hate to repeat because it's so gut-wrenching that my feeling is that the jury is going to need post-traumatic stress disorder uh, treatment. Um, what do you think is the worst fact in this case for Eric Boyd, who, by the way, has never been tried for the murder of either of these two? This is the first time, and this is a case that happened nearly two decades ago. Well, I'm not sure what the worst fact would be, but one of the interesting thing, what, things were that the neighbor, when you tie everything together, saw four males, three of whom now are convicted, uh, the fourth one perhaps maybe on trial, and in, in the uh, victim's car, the forerunner, uh, the woman's car. Uh, when you take that, it puts another individual, male, at the scene, and uh, his whole defense is premised on that I wasn't there. And then you have the other issues with respect to the other car that was his cousin's car that was in the vicinity. Um, it, it starts to draw a connection there. And plus, uh, one of the defendants may have also identified him. Yeah. So you know what? We just heard, as you know, from Kara Hodge, she was the, the best friend of the female victim, OK, Shannon. Let's hear from Josh Anderson. He was one of the best friends of the male victim, Chris Newsom. This crime occurred back in 2007. I should say these horrible crimes, almost, you know, in, in the second decade ago. Uh, Bob Hillier, when I listen to Josh Anderson, right, he's, he is still crying. He is still upset. It is still emotion, no matter how many times he's testified in the past. Now, if you're a jury sitting on there, do you automatically hate Eric Boyd because of this? Do you, do you just say, that's it, he's done? Well, you can't desense. I don't think the jury can desensitize themselves in this case. It's so horrific. The question they're going to be looking at is, is Boyd the fourth person maybe that was seen in that car or the person that was involved in this horrible crime? If they believe that, they're going to show no mercy for him. And, and indeed, it looks like, Mike Corbonix, that there was an attempt to somehow change the look of the car. Can you explain that to our viewers? Well, <clears throat> the change of look of the car, and I know there was something with the stickers, things of that nature. Been pulled off. I think it makes it very difficult when you change the look of the car for somebody to readily identify it or to get hot on your trail, for lack of a better term. So the car doesn't stand out as much, and it looks really a lot like there was some help. Although there's an interesting point on that, and I don't know if they got to it in Cross or they're going to, is if so many people, and Eric was supposedly someone who was found guilty of, who was trying to help in the federal case hide a co-defendant, I would go pretty hard at that, that his DNA wasn't found on the car, because that would show he had no help in trying to camouflage the car or doing anything of that okay, nature. Okay, because, yeah, when you're pulling a sticker off, well, of course you could have gloves, but you would think that if you're pulling it off, you're going to get a lot of DNA. Maybe maybe there was some clawing of the sticker that didn't have to do with him. What do you think? Maybe well, and the time else. frame here was very compressed between when the, when the crime happened and when they arrested these individuals. So this gets back to Mike's point that, you know, DNA could play an important role here, or the absence of it might the play. The absence, or as I've heard in some cases that I've tried, uh, when there's an absence of DNA and the prosecutor will say, well, that doesn't mean anything. The absence of evidence is not evidence. We shall see, though. Let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back with my New Jersey panel. 
Well, that was a quick witness because that was one of the neighbors, and she's testifying or told the police what she saw and what she didn't see. Mike Corbonix, you made a point about the cross-examination. I love that cross-examination because that's what good trial lawyers well, what did do. She, what did she, what did the cross-examination, what did he bring out? He brought out nothing, and he brought out that she could not identify her client. That's a skilled cross-examination, even though it's five questions. It's quantity. It's not quantity, it's quality. So, Bob, the cross-examination of Sandra Donald Bible, I think I had her name last wrong when I talked about it, was that even though she saw people, she couldn't identify Eric Boyd as one of the people, correct? Uh, yes, and, and basically this case is all about whether Eric Boyd was the one who was involved. Right, because they've convicted, they've convicted other people already of the murder, right? They have uh, Lamarcus Stevenson, they have, uh, I'm going to read them, Latalis Davidson, George Thomas, who's going to testify in this trial, and also Vanessa Coleman of some aspect related to the crime but not murder. So we have another witness on the stand, guys. Guess what? It, it is a police officer uh, as they're giving his name. Why don't we listen and see what he brings to the table and whether or not he investigated this crime or interviewed any of the neighbors? Okay, so this is Lieutenant Keith DeBow under cross-examination. He actually headed the SWAT team to secure the house, the Chipman house, where the body oh, stuffed in a trash can. And, and the jury saw pictures. Obviously, we're not going to show pictures. But I just wanted to talk to my um, guest about that, because when he was discussing the body stuffed in the trash can, and there were, I believe, three pictures, 34, 35, and there's six of it oddly shaped, and looked and you see the body. I saw the defendant, now I'm wearing glasses, but I saw the defendant with his eyes go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Does that mean anything to you, or do you advise clients not to do something like that? Because it, it kind of looked like he was like trying not to look, but he was looking. Well, <clears throat> I think it's a very difficult position for a defendant, because all eyes are on you no matter what you do. <clears throat> and you better tell your defendant that. Be careful what you say. Be careful how you look. Don't look disrespectful. But, you know, maybe the jury's interpreting that this defendant has feelings as well. We're talking about desensitizing the jury. I mean, anybody looks at it, especially if you, if you didn't have, you're gonna, if he doesn't look at it, I think it looks worse. Well, but, but Bob, he's, it's like he was looking at it, but then, okay, I was told not to look at it. I'm looking at it, not looking at it. To me, that just, and I know jurors watch everything, okay, and as you know, if a juror is looking at that and saying, well, his eye movements weren't very good, that's, that could hurt, right? I, I think it can hurt um, if, if it's not appropriate, but here you have evidence up there. Chances are the jury's looking at the same evidence, so they're not even paying attention uh -huh. to the glands. Um, and they're, this, good, this man's good, on trial for murder, so good, good he's going to be looking at the evidence. The jury better be looking at the evidence. You know, we're going to take a quick break, but you have to stay tuned because now we are getting into the gruesomeness of this case. And while there have been people convicted, these victims deserve justice if indeed Eric Boyd was one of them. Okay, this is the case of Tennessee versus Eric Boyd. So what you just had there, my two guests from New Jersey, uh, Bob Hilla and Mike Corabonics, is you had the witness who before told us that he saw Shannon's car uh, there, and also uh, now he's got another white car, and we are going to come to learn that that's going to belong to Eric Boyd's cousin, uh, who we're going to hear from, as you can imagine, pretty soon. Her name is Adrian Mathis. But tell me why that's important that the two cars are at the scene. Bob. Well, I think that if this is Boyd's cousin's car and the jury believes that he's identified it accurately uh, and um, Boyd had control of that car during the relevant period of time, it places Boyd, you know, in, as being involved. Well, what if, if Boyd had control? What if somebody else was in the car with him and Boyd just happened to be in the car, right? Does that solve the problem? Does that answer the question of that whether Boyd's involved in the murder of these two young uh, people? I don't think it does. Because I think as a defense attorney, you're going to say this is just circumstance, although circumstantial evidence is very strong in the right context. But I think what you're going to hear the defense be is this, is listen, this was his cousin's car. You may have to admit at some point in time that, you know, federally he pled, to, he pled guilty to hiding one of the defendants. He didn't yeah. plead guilty, he was found guilty of hiding one of the defendants. So it's sort of almost and, a fit And the lead defendant, thing. the big defendant, the, the, the guy who uh, clearly was the ringleader, right, Bob Hiller? Yes, uh, cross is going to be interesting here because it's all going to come down to how the, the, the perceptions of this witness were. I mean, he talks about he assumed that they were uh, of a certain race based on demeanor. I don't know what expertise, why there was no objection on that, but maybe they're going to have some fun with that on cross-examination. And if they can start to chip away at some of these observations, it could... 
uh, undercut the uh, state's case. Well, you know what? We, are, we know, because it happened earlier, uh, that there were fireworks in the courtroom when the next witness came on the stand. But we're going to say that because we want you to come back to the Long Crime Network and listen to what happened in the courtroom in Eric's board case this morning. Okay, so it can be tedious testimony, gentlemen, my New Jersey gentlemen lawyers, uh, Bob Hilly, but to preserve a crime scene so that you get proper fingerprints, proper DNA, and what this, what he's doing here, this retired detective with 45 years of experience is very important, isn't it? Science is absolutely important in a case like this because Why? you're going to want to build that circumstantial case. You have no, at least to, to this point in the trial, direct eyewitness puts Boyd in the crime scene while the crime is occurring. So you're going to need to build that, as Mike said before, through circumstantial evidence. And science plays a big role in that. So we just saw him pull out, we're watching a shoe. He's taking out a shoe. Now we do know that there was a shoe of the other victim who was found, Chris Newsom, on the train tracks. Uh, uh, that, you know, unfortunately that was, that was whole. And the question is, can this shoe be matched to anything? And if it can't be, what, what is important about it? Well, even if it can be, in this trial, I don't think it's significant. Why? Because Why? Your, your defense is not that, that these people didn't undergo a horrible death and horrible torture. It's my guy wasn't there. Well, so this is Chris. I'm going to give you a piece of information. This is Chris Newsom's shoe. He has Chris Newsom's shoe in his hand. Does it matter if, if one shoe is on Chris Newsom in the, at the train tracks or they're both on him or one's at the house? Or, why, only, is the, why do the facts matter for Eric Boyd? They don't matter. This oh, my this God. He, he just said, he, my defense attorney, Bob Hill, had just said the, what this man is testifying to on the stand, Gerald Smith, what he's doing doesn't matter to Eric Boyd's trial. Do you, do you agree? Well, I think it matters in the context of all the other evidence in the case. As, as uh, one isolated bit of evidence, it may have no meaning in the case. But again, the state has to prove two things. One, they have to prove that a crime occurred and the, the serious nature of the crime. And then they have to prove that the defendant committed that crime. That's right. That's so right. a lot of this is going to be the backdrop for what happened and, and how things happen, and then identifying these individuals as the victims, and then they have to tie in Boyd. Well, let's see. Let's listen more, and let's see whether or not this connects what Gerald Smith is testifying to, connects Eric Boyd, who's on trial right now for these murders, to the crime scenes. Okay, so Mike Corbonix, now what he's testifying to is items found in the place that the real bad guy, Latalvis Davison, was, was uh, remember, arrested. We heard about that, you know, bring your hands up, I had a plan. All right, so how does this connect to Eric Boyd? I don't see how it does. Mere presence or is not a crime for Eric Boyd. If he knew about it, that doesn't mean he participated in it. Ah, uh, but let me stop you, Bob Hiller. I mean, he was already convicted in the federal court of hiding, right? Hiding, and he played, uh, you know, Miss Prison, whatever he wanted to do, one of the bad guys here, Davidson. So doesn't it connect in a certain way? Well, that's an interesting point in terms of what from that case or that conviction, because you had a conviction, uh, enters in here with respect to his connection to the scene um, or whether you even need that at all. I don't know yet from what we've seen in the evidence whether that'll be the case. So we're going to wait and see whether or not somehow Tennessee is going to decide to enter the federal conviction. We can talk about that later. And we also remember have that fireworks issue in the courtroom earlier. So you're going to have to stay with us here at the Long Crime Network because we are covering this case involving Tennessee versus Eric Boyd where two victims were brutally, brutally sexually assaulted and then murdered. I'm Linda Kenny Bodden. I have two great guests only here at the Long and Crime Network. Stay tuned.